Hi, this is Mark Birch with a quick revision of Macbeth Act 5, Scene 3. Shakespeare begins the scene with an arrogant Macbeth stating, Bring me no more reports, let them all fly till Burnham Wood removed to Dunsinane, I cannot taint with fear. And this is really interesting structurally because Shakespeare's juxtaposed this scene with the previous scene that concluded with the Scottish lords proclaiming their march towards Burnham. So we've got Burnham Wood about to move to Dunsinane. The audience is very aware of it. And so Shakespeare's preparing the audience for Macbeth's tragic fall as a result of his hubris, as a result of this kind of arrogant pride. Macbeth recounts the premonitions that have given him this hubris. What's the boy Malcolm? Was he not born of woman? Um, he essentially feels completely invulnerable. And what Shakespeare is doing is reminding us that the cause of that hubris is the supernatural. Uh, the spirits that know all mortal consequences are those that have pronounced me thus and therefore removed all of Macbeth's fear. Macbeth calls to the Scottish lords who are departing his castle, stating, fly false fanes and mingle with the English epicures. In other words, dismissing them. He doesn't need these people to defend his castle because he feels invulnerable. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about it is the use of phonological devices. You have fly false fanes and then English epicures. So these two groups of people are connected because the same kinds of phonological features define them. We have the alliteration in fly faults, and then that's directly juxtaposed to the assonance in English epicures. You can hear that there's the same kind of process being applied to both of their descriptions, and thereby they seem to have a similarity. And for Macbeth, of course, they are similar in that they're going to join forces against him. And that's represented, therefore, by that phonological similarity. Macbeth goes on to say, The mind I sway by and the heart I bear shall never sag with doubt nor shake with fear. The parallelism in the mind I sway by and the heart I bear gives a sense of the whole of him being resolved, um, both his mind and his heart, his reason and his emotions um, are both conjoined in recognising that he will never submit to doubt or fear. In the following utterances, Shakespeare goes on to employ colour symbolism to represent fear. And it's interesting that despite fearlessness being a key aspect of Macbeth's imminent downfall, Shakespeare presents him as mocking fear in others. He's just claimed not to submit to fear, and yet when he examines it in those around him, he sees it as an opportunity to gloat at their perceived weakness. Therefore, when we have um, the servant come in, he's described as a cream-faced loon. He's a lily-livered boy with linen cheeks, whey face. All of these are linked to whiteness, and whiteness is symbolic of cowardice. He asks him to overread thy fear, you know, to pinch his face, to make his cheeks go a little bit redder in order to disguise the fear that's apparent in that white complexion. We then start to get a little bit of pity for Macbeth. We've moved from this mocking, hubris-ridden character to one that seems to recognise his fate. He says, this push will cheer me ever or deceit me now. The antithetical parallelism recognising that there is a stark contrast in what lies ahead. Either he will be secure on the throne and happy forever, cheer me ever, or he will be deceited now. Um, so he will lose his throne and ultimately lose his life. He says, I've lived long enough. My way of life is fallen into the seer, the yellow leaf. So we have this horticultural metaphor. It's the idea of Macbeth's life as a dying plant, echoing Act 5, Scene 2. Um, and there's this sense of self-awareness that's evident in the rest of this speech as well that reminds the audience of Macbeth's nobility, that nobility that was demonstrated at the beginning of the play um, and that was referred to in Act 1, Scene 2, creating the opportunity for pity as a crucial part of the play's tragic conclusion. Um, we shouldn't just be celebrating the fall of the um, tragic character. We should recognise that this is a loss in some way and there has been a manipulation of Macbeth uh, by external forces. Macbeth's statement that I'll fight till from my bones my flesh be hacked is once again a reminder of Act 1, Scene 2 because we have an articulation of his bravery, his violence and once again there's that horror there which is very similar to the Macbeth described by the captain in Act 1, Scene 2. 
A reading makes it difficult to appreciate the dramatic significance of the process of Macbeth putting on his armour, but we get a sense of Macbeth's frustration and impatience through the kind of rush that's engaged in here in order to put his armour on, even when it's not needed. So that he says, give me my armour. Satan tells him it's not needed yet. I'll put it on. And then later, come put mine armour on. Come, sir, dispatch. And then pull it off, I say. It's all over the place. So Macbeth is clearly in a situation where he's not in his right mind. He's not ordered. He's not dealing with the current situation in the way that um, someone who's in command should. We get more sense of Macbeth's impatience when he states, throw physic to the dogs, I'll none of it. Just because the doctor says that um, he can't cure uh, Lady Macbeth, the patient must minister to himself, then Macbeth kind of dismisses the whole concept of medicine itself. He'll throw physic to the dogs. Macbeth proposes to the doctor that if he could find the disease of Scotland, Macbeth would applaud him. And that's deeply ironic because Macbeth is himself the disease that's plaguing Scotland. We've got the same kind of imagery that was used in Act 5, Scene 2, when the Scottish Lords stated, meet we the medicine of the sickly wheel. So Macbeth and the Scottish Lords both appreciate that Scotland's in a terrible state. The difference is that uh, the Lords recognise that this is because of Macbeth's rule, whereas Macbeth is in a state of ignorance, refusing to accept that this is a result of his own rule. Okay, tough.